have started a company? Okay, raise your hand really high so I can see. Okay, how many of you would like to start a company? Okay, well, yeah, it's still more like 60%. So I'd say most of us have that adventurous spirit and um, we're not lacking in the risk tolerant gene in this room. So I figured as much. But um, I'm not here to talk about taking risk because I think most of you are capable of doing that. I'm, gonna, I'm here to try to give you sort of a framework for evaluating risk. So a lot of us are facing risky decisions, forks in the road. Some of you probably work for a very comfortable company or safe environment, an established firm, and maybe you're thinking about jumping ship and, and joining another company that, or a startup that isn't well capitalized, or a startup that, maybe your own startup that has zero capitalization. Or some of you maybe are at a startup and you've been doing it for two, five years and saying, you know what, now it's time to get a paycheck and, uh, and, and get into a grown-up company. Or some of you are deciding on business models. That's, that's really tough, right? Making a switch to a business model, that's very, very risky. So I like what Yogi Berra says about, about forks in the road. Well, basically what he says is when you face a fork in the road, just take it. <laughs> so what he means is that, look, both decisions are going to have its hardships. It's just sometimes you just don't see it right away. So every decision has its own risk calculus. Every decision has its own opportunity cost. What you may think is the safest decision may actually be the riskiest decision. And what you think is the riskiest decision could actually turn out to be the safest decision. So how do you know? How do you know? So I have a framework for that. But before I get into that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. First time I'm sharing my own story. So when I was younger, I was a pretty good artist and uh, won some art competitions, so I got into three art colleges, and I decided that I was going to choose the college that was affiliated with the university because I wanted to take other classes besides art because as I started thinking about four years of refining my trade to have a career, and a career is defined by Webster's Dictionary is a job or profession that you do for a very long time, and so I thought job, making money, art, I'm going to starve. And I didn't want to be a starving artist. And so immediately when I got into school, I started taking accounting classes because I figured if my artwork wasn't good enough to sell, at least I'd know how to sell somebody else's art. And then a few months passed, and I wasn't really quite happy with that passion, with that art form. <laughs> so I became a double major in dance and accounting. Well, by the time I completed my sophomore year, my left side of the brain the practical side was just like pounding and I had this voice shouting at me like, are you crazy? The shelf life of a dancer at my age would be 10 years. I was 19, so by 29 I'd basically be washed up, I'd be retired, I'd be facing an early midlife crisis at 30 and um, that didn't sit well with me. So I thought, you know, I keep struggling with the arts, I'm just going to drop it all together and just focus on career, making money. So what did I do? Um, I focused on Wall Street. I, um, I got an internship my junior year. I graduated with an economics degree. I was on a trading desk at JP Morgan by the time I graduated. And nine months after that, I was managing a billion dollar fixed income port fund with three other managers. So economically speaking, I was, I was doing really well. I um, was 23 years old. I had enough money to buy a condo at a closet full of Brooks Brothers pinstripe $300 suits. And um, basically I was uh, this gal. <laughs> I'm really dating myself now, but you, you know, Melanie Griffith. She was like, she was the bomb. She was, she, was the, she was the quintessential role model for success. Circa 90s, well somebody said actually 80s, but late 90s, early, late, late 80s, early 90s. Anyway, she was, she was awesome yeah, last year. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, and um, but you know what? Once that novelty wears off, because there's a novelty in sort of this image that you're going after, and once the paycheck wore off, then I had to actually think about what I was doing every day and the act of doing something every day to get that paycheck. And after a while, it was sort of sort of void of meaning. I mean, because you really have to start concentrating on what you're doing every day, and I didn't really love it. And that's when I started thinking about college, because that was at the time that was when I was starting thinking about 
you know, meaning and what I enjoyed. And what I realized was that the problem with college is that it encourages you to focus so much on a, on a career, something you do for money. And what colleges should be doing is encouraging you to refine your hobbies, something you wouldn't do for external reward. And look, there's nothing wrong with being practical or teaching practicalities of life, but the challenge becomes when you're trying to figure out what you enjoy. It all of a sudden starts getting skewed when you're, starting, when you're thinking so practically. And the problem with not understanding who you are and what you enjoy is that it distorts all your risk preferences. So you ha it has to start there. You have to understand what you enjoy and then your risk preferences aren't so distorted. Mine were. So what I thought was safe, I thought, you know, getting a job, going on Wall Street, that is going to be safe. Well, actually, what I ended up doing was risking four years of obsessively pursuing my passion. And those are four years I'll never have back. And those were four years when I was very young. Those could have been very good years, especially if you wanted to be a dancer. And so I said, well, you know what? I'm not going to waste four years anymore. So I went back to the arts. And uh, a different art form, I became a writer. But I did that a lot, too. I had a journal ever since I was in second grade, so it was still a bit of an art form. And something else changed. I had a different goal. It wasn't to make money, but it was to make people think through my writing. It was very similar to what I did with art. I wanted to make people think through my drawings or paintings, or I wanted to make, pe make people pause when I danced. I wanted to make people think. And the funny thing is, I wasn't a starving artist, because I had five jobs. <laughs> And, but that was okay. What you realize is that you're, you become very resourceful when you're doing what you love. And the other thing, the other byproduct that is uh, surprising and massive is that uh, when you're doing something you love, there's uh, amazing things that can happen. And so I didn't make a lot of money in the beginning, but I gained a ton of influence, a ton of influence. I had 400,000 subscribers. This was pre-Twitter. So probably a couple million Twitter followers because it's so easy to get Twitter followers today. And you had to spend $2 million just to advertise on my newsletter. And that was one channel. So the money came. And I didn't even focus on it at all. And so now I know what this, the old sage, Master Ugwe <laughs> from Kung Fu Panda says, one often meets his destiny on the road he takes to avoid it. And so I tried to avoid the arts, but I ended up back on it anyway. That was my destiny. So how do, you, how do you get to your destiny? How do you not waste four years of your life? And how do you not distort your risk preferences? Well, I have four things, four things to look at. There are no safe decisions. Brandon, I changed that because of you. <laughs> Find out what makes your heart sing. Build up your risk muscle and reduce variables and always be prepared. So I'll just go through those four quickly. So those, there are no safe decisions. This one's a really easy one. Look, I know a lot of us, when we face decisions, we say one is safe and one is risky. We all do that. So the challenge with doing that is that when you say something is safe, you have a tendency not to even investigate it. You have a tendency to just overlook it. So if you are in a safe position today, or if you are trying to make a decision to be in a safe place, just ask yourself, ask yourself, safe from what? Write that down. No, ask yourself, safe from what? And if it's safe from starving for money, then ask yourself, if you had it all, if you had all that money, then what would you be starving for? So there are no safe decisions. Everything's risky, um, so investigate it. So that's point number one. Point number two, what makes your heart sing? Just like I said earlier, Yogi Berra said, look, just take it. You know, both roads are going to have its own hardships. And not only that, when you take a road, you're gonna be met with successive forks in the road and you're going to be faced with difficulties. And it's going to be what your love and your passion for, thing, for that road or that goal that may be the only thing that will keep you on it. So you better love what you're doing. What is your intrinsic motivation? So that in psychology, it's sort of what occurs when we're doing something that without external reward. It's something like exploring or learning. It's actualizing your potential. What is your intrinsic motivation? So Steve Jobs, everybody knows, famously dropped out of Reed's College, and he took a calligraphy course. And this is what he said about it. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle. It fascinated me. And none of it had any practical application. 
Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't it be awesome to just do something that we loved, do something that fascinated us? Just imagine how much more we would know about ourselves. And that's what we're trying to do is understand what it is that fascinates us because then we can actualize our potential. But it was 10 years later when it actually came back to him. So it's no surprise that what made Steve Jobs' heart sing was marrying artistry and technology. So a lot of people, a lot of companies actually talk about what makes their heart sing through their mission statement. So this is Mark Zuckerberg. Me, this was a long time ago. So Mark had just um, quit Harvard and he was moving out here to Palo Alto, and I asked him, well, what is it that makes your heart sing? What, is your, what drives you? And he said, well, I want my classmates to share their schedules. That was pretty much it at the time, because he was still at Harvard, he was still in college. But it hasn't changed much. Now it's give people the power to share. But basically what he wanted to do was empower his classmates to share, and that was his mission statement. When uh, Google, Larry Page, I met Larry Page there, they had 10 people in their company and, and I asked him what his mission statement was. It was to organize the world's information, and it still remains the same. Of course, it's a much bigger mission, but it's still pretty consistent. That was what it was when they had 10 people in the company. So what makes your heart sing? And it's not, it's not a paycheck. You know, it's not a title. It's not a checklist. Don't make those what makes your heart sing, because you won't be happy. That isn't what makes your heart sing. Okay, so uh, just to recap what we're talking about, we're trying to talk about evaluating risk, making our decisions clear. One, there's no safe de decisions. Remember, it's not risky. Safe, it's risky, risky. Ask yourself if you're in a safe place, why, and what, what are you safe from? Find out what makes your heart sing. Again, every decision is gonna be met with multiple and successive decisions to stay on that road, so you better really like that road. And third is build up your risk muscle. Okay, so you figured out what road you're going to take, right? You found out what your heart sing, what makes your heart sing. Now your job is to exercise. Build up those muscles so you can get down that road, reduce the obstacles in your way, reduce the variables. So if you think about games, games fall onto, on the spectrum of chance to skill, and there's a bunch of stuff in the middle of it that we need to reduce. This is what I call reducing variables. Physique, talent, knowledge, experience, you reduce those to move the game from chance to skill. So I just did a triathlon on Saturday, and I'm a terrible swimmer. And put me on a, on a bicycle, give me 100 miles with a bunch of climbs, and I know exactly how to approach that. I can strategize all day. Swimming, no chance. I have no idea how to pace myself. So what did I do? Well, I got in the pool, and I swam, and I swam. I really don't like pools. I really don't like open water. I don't like cold either. So, but what did I do? I kept practicing. And what did I, I did that because I needed to move away from chance and drowning toward skill. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the funny thing is, is that risk is a lot like that. So if you think about our bodies, we're not naturally meant to be in the water. Right? We're just, we walk, you know, we're meant for the ground. It's very uncomfortable to be in the water. So, but if you have to do something, if you have to swim, then you need to put yourself in that water all the time, every day. You need to build up those swim muscles. And risk is the same way. The physiology of our brain is that our brain is fixed to, or wired to avoid pain, avoid fear, avoid discomfort. The brain is wired to keep us in a safe place, to resist change. So if our brain is not wired to take these risks and, and be in these uncomfortable positions, then we need to practice being. We need to force ourselves because it's not natural. And we also have to do that because it's in these positions of discomfort. It's, it's these positions outside of our comfort zone where we actually can expand our capabilities, right? I mean, look, you're in a comfortable position. You're not going to do anything that you haven't done before, right? But you, what you want to do is expand your ca capabilities because that moves you toward skill. So you need to reduce the variables, and the only way to do that is to get into a risky position, in an uncomfortable position, so you can find yourself, um, find yourself figuring out how to get out of that uh, position and expanding your capabilities. So um, I have a, another thing that, you, that happens when you're doing this too, you, you start understanding what your risk profile is. 
what you don't like, what you're, what you're good at. And Adam Goldenberg, who is the founder and CEO of Just Fab, he's speaking tomorrow. So he had started four companies before Just Fab. So he has been, he's been doing this a lot. And finally, he decided for Just Fab, what he was gonna do was he was going to bootstrap. So I said, Adam, you started four companies, you've sold one, he was part of the Intermix team that was, sold, that was part of MySpace, sold the News Corp for $600 million. And I said, why are you bootstrapping? He's like, well, because I know my risk profile. I said, I want a lifestyle business. I don't want the pressure of the venture capital gain. So it was pretty clear to him. He had, under, he had such a scope of that road that he had taken so many times before that he knew exactly what to do. But the other way to look at this too is if you think about, if you think about risk as something really large, what you could do is divide it up into chunks. So if you go to the, if you go to the gym, right, you're not gonna be going in there lifting tons of weights, right? You're not gonna go in there and lift 200, 200 pounds. You're gonna go in there and lift 50, 75. You're gonna build up to it. And Adam did the same thing. He had a huge risk, right, a big company, which could be, big, could be a big risk. But what he did was he bootstrapped it, meaning, meaning he didn't come out of the gate with a lot of risk on his shoulders. He came out of the gate with a very small risk and he built up the risk commensurate with the company as the company grew. So that's what you do. You sort of take the risk in little chunks. It's the same thing as if you want to expand your product into the market. And all of you know, most of you know this already, right? You don't blanket the entire country. What do you do? You start with a little, you start with your, your industry, you start with your city, you start with your, your uh, region and you own it. You take small risks there, you figure it out and then you get all the problems solved and then you replicate that. That's how you expand, right? You take small risk and then you build it up. You don't take, it a, big, take a big one. So that's, how, that's the game, move from chance to skill. Finally, last one is always be prepared. You know, one of the ways to reduce variables is be prepared. Stay sharp, stay, stay on your game. So another story of mine, when I was at CNN, I had this amazingly horrific job. And um, it was, I felt like I was in purgatory. I was uh, humiliated. I didn't feel appreciated. I was a tape librarian. Does anybody even know what that is? That, uh, that's a person that you say, hey, go grab a, an image of the exterior of IBM. Okay, I got it. You know, go get people trading. I mean, it was brainless. I could do it in an hour out of an eight hour day. So, um, so I had a lot of time on my hands, but I stayed focused on what it is I wanted to do. What was my goal? My goal was to make people think through my writing. And so I looked around me, I thought, wow, I have all these resources. I have these newspapers. I've got surrounded by so much. And so I said, you know, I'm gonna take advantage of this situation. You're paying me to learn. <laughs> You're paying me to get really smart. And so I did. I was surrounded by video, so I figured out how to make stories through video. I was surrounded by newspapers, and so I just absorbed all the current news and information. Well, one day, one day, one of the producers said, I need somebody to go out and interview the chairman and CEO of Viacom. Now, this is CNN. We've got a big staff, and nobody was around. Nobody wanted to do it. No reporters, no senior producers. So I said, uh, I'll do it. I was a tape librarian. And so they said, oh, okay. So you try it, so I did it. I landed the interviews, I did the interviews, and I wasn't a tape librarian much longer. In fact, I wasn't after that, so. Um, but that's because I stayed focused. I wasn't disillusioned, I wasn't upset. I took advantage of what the opportunity they gave me, and I said, you know what? I want this. And so when the opportunity presented itself, I could jump on it. If I were at the bar moping, or if I was thinking about you know, working on my resume because I was un unhappy there, I wouldn't have seen the opportunity. And the whole point is if you're prepared, you'll see the opportunity. So if you've been rejected by a VC and angel, if somebody's told you, you know, you're not good enough and that idea stinks, well, you know what? Don't blame the situation just focus on what it is that you want to do. And the opportunity will present itself, but you won't see it unless you're prepared. And that's it. All right. <laughs> I'm going to time for questions. <laughs>